All right, welcome to uh, the National Community Action Partnership uh, Energy Partnerships Project um, webinar series. Today, um, we have a panel of several presenters uh, from several federal agencies. So the, the content today is very exciting. We have a lot to move through. So we're going to ask that everybody hold their questions until the end. Um, there will be a copy of the slides that goes out by email from me at the end. Um, and my name is Amy Jandusa English. I'm the project director for energy partnerships here at the National Partnership. Uh, before we proceed, I think we're gonna do the promise of community action. Most of our attendees are um, from community action agencies, but some of you aren't. Feel free to come off mute and join if join in if you'd like. Next slide, please. The promise of community action. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. Next slide. All right, as I said, we have quite an impressive panel today. The first speaker is going to be from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, Kim Nesbitt. I see that the numbers are still going up. So do we still have folks in the waiting room? All right, let's go ahead. Um, I'll turn it over to Kim Nesbitt to get started with our content. Our content. And for those of you who are joining, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Great, thank you, Amy. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, depending on what time zone you're in. My name is Kim Nesbitt. I'm a government technical representative with the Office of Lead Hazard Control in Healthy Homes within the Housing and Urban Development Department. I would like to welcome you to this session on leveraging federal home retrofit programs for households aging in place. The choice to age in place is a personal decision that is based on many factors. Many older adults choose to age in place for as long as they are able to. In this webinar, we will highlight some federal programs from the Department of Energy, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the United States Department of Agriculture. These programs are available to older adult, low-income homeowners to help them age in place, effectively by increasing safety, accessibility, and functionality of their home. So this afternoon, uh, we're just going to ask that you will put, put your questions in the chat or the Q&A box. So that's our little housekeeping tip. Um, we have the contact information for all of our presenters. It's included in the slides. So if you have a specific question to any of our presenters, you may also email them. So at this point, I want to introduce the speakers for today. And that will be uh, Ryan Elza with the Administration for Community and Living, Amanda Raines with the Department of Energy, Tanika Blue with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We have Sashin Scott with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Brenda Reyes with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and Andrea Hydley with the United States Department of Agriculture. At this time, we'll have our first presenter and I'll turn it over to Ryan Elsa. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Thank you for having me today. My name is Ryan Elza and I'm the Interagency Housing Innovation and Strategy Lead for the Administration of Community Living, which is an operating division of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Today, I'll be discussing realizing housing stability for people with disabilities and older adults and opportunities to partner with the Disability and Aging Network to achieve this goal. Oh, oh sorry, next slide. And next slide. 
Um, first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Housing and Services Resource Center, or HSRC, which was launched in partnership between the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The Housing and Services Resource Center fosters cross-sector partnership between organizations and systems that provide housing resources and homeless services, healthcare and mental health services, independent living services, and other supportive services. The HSRC is a part of an interagency initiative to streamline and expand access to affordable, accessible housing and the critical services that make community living possible. Next slide, please. Increasing accessibility in the home creates increased stability and decreases the possibility of becoming homeless or having to enter an institution for people with disabilities and older adults. Home modifications, repairs, and weatherizations can improve older adults and people with disabilities' ability to live in their homes. Home modifications can be, uh, or services can reduce the need to live to leave the home uh, one cannot function in. Home repair services can reduce the need to leave the home because one cannot manage the upkeep and weatherization services can reduce the need to leave the home due to inadequate temperature control or other in-hospital conditions. For older adults to live successfully and stably in their homes and housing has to be, uh, or in their home, housing has to be affordable, but housing stability is more than financial. It also encompasses accessibility, a way to obtain supportive services that are needed and wanted in community uh, and the community with ready access to grocery stores, community gatherings, healthcare, transportation, and more. Today, we're focusing on accessibility, especially as it relates to fall prevention. Next slide, please. There is a national lack of accessible housing in our nation. There are 23.1 million American households that have an accessibility need and 40% of American households in which a person lives in a home that does not have the accessibility features they need to live safely and successfully in the community. And in 47% of homes, climbing up or down the stairs to enter the home is required. Just 14% of households that include persons with accessibility needs report having a ramp or lift of some type. Next slide, please. Falls have a widespread and serious impact on older, adult, on older adults' health. The statistics are mind-numbing. One in four older adults will fall each year. Falls are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries among older adults, and each year, three million people are treated in emergency departments for fall injuries. Falls may significantly reduce the ability of an older adult population to remain independent, and those who have fallen may become afraid to fall again no matter where they live. Next slide. For those of you who aren't familiar with ACL, our mission, uh, next slide please. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with ACL, our mission is to make community living a reality for all people regardless of disability or age. We have aging and disability networks made up of over 20,000 community-based organizations in every state and across the country to provide direct services and advocacy to make this a reality. Organizations in these networks, like area agencies on aging and centers for independent living, are staffed by people that live and know the community and culture. The network serves a diverse population. For example, in 2019, through the Older Americans Act, the network served over 10 million people with approximately 2.7 million registered clients. These networks have decades of experience in helping people access and enroll in publicly funded programs and receive home and community-based services, housing, and housing-related services. Partnerships are foundational elements of these networks to streamline access to services for the people that we serve. Next slide. Here you can see a list of the many types of organizations that make up the disability and aging networks. Aging and Disability Resource Centers and No Wrong Door Systems, as already mentioned, Area Agencies on Aging and Centers for Independent Living, Councils on Developmental Disabilities, Elder Rights and Services, Adult Protective Services, Assistive Technology Act Programs, Benefit Enrollment Centers, Protection and Advocacy Programs, and University Centers for Excellence in De Developmental Disabilities. You can learn more about these organizations at acl.gov and find um, where these organizations might be located within your local community. Next slide, please. For older adults and people with disabilities, community living requires both access to affordable, accessible housing and a range of community services, including home and community-based services, behavioral health services, and tenancy supports. 
Home and community-based services are person-centered care delivered in home and community to enable people to stay in their homes rather than moving to a nursing home or other facility for care. Here, you can see examples of the types of home and community-based services delivered through the Disability and Aging Networks, which includes home repairs and modifications. Next slide. So how do you find the Disability and Aging Network agencies? You can find a list of programs and resources uh, at the Housing Services Resource Center website. All the programs and resources on this page are operated or funded by the federal government, and I will drop a link into the chat. The uh, Disability Information Access Line dial helps people with disabilities get connected to information about local community resources that support independent living. And dial also provides information about essential services such as transportation, housing support, disability rights, and more. The Elder Care Locator can connect older adults to resources available where they live through a 1-800 number, or you can visit the website to chat live or browse resources. And you can also locate your State Assistive Technology Act program that can help individuals learn about, use, and acquire assistive technology that enables them to carry out activities of daily living independently. Next slide. HSRC has produced two action guides to advance home modifications and home retrofit programs. The first, the power of cross-sector partnerships to advance home modifications. This action guide was developed for organizations in the aging and disability networks and other community-based organizations, housing providers, public housing authorities, and health systems and providers. It provides tools for building cross-sector partnerships to promote home modifications that support community living, how to find potential partners and how to approach them and how to create plans and agreements. Health, housing, disability, and aging data sources uh, communicate the need to start and sustain programs with new partners and funders. Next slide. The second action guide is partnering to expand home modifications, repairs, and weatherization for community living. This action guide provides approaches for aging, disability, and health organizations on way to build partnerships with the housing sector for home modifications, repairs, and weatherization services. These partnerships can offer access to specialized funding sources and expertise, support to document the need for home modifications or repairs and weatherizations in the community and contribution of a housing perspective, development of champions with the housing sector who can build awareness, knowledge, and engagement among their peers, how to approach potential partners and create a plan for collaborative activity, and types of activities to increase access to home modifications, repairs, and weatherization services, such as educating consumers, engaging volunteers, and streamlining access to services. Features, uh, example, it features examples of partnerships with housing organizations for improved service delivery and resources to support your efforts. Next slide. The HSRC is your research center, so please email us at hsrc at acl.hhs.gov about your technical assistance needs, our uh, suggestions for the resource center, and your own cross-sector partnerships that we can lift up. You can sign up for the HSRC listserv at the website and to receive notices about our upcoming webinars, uh, new resources or tools and the latest updates. Thank you. And now I'll pass it to my colleague, Kim, uh, at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Thank you, Ryan. Next slide, please. Great. So now we're gonna present a case study to you. We want you to meet Mr. and Mrs. Jones, an elderly couple, 62 years of age. Mr. Jones has just come back from the hospital and is permanently wheelchair bound. Miss Jones loves to cook in her outdated kitchen and has a history of falls. They live in a single story home built in 1973 in West Union, Ohio, a rural community. They complain the house is cold and drafty, but are concerned about an increased high heating bill. They enjoy babysitting their four and six-year-old grandchildren every day for four hours. The Joneses applied for low-income heating energy and assistant program, LAHEAT, and were referred to the weatherization program. In this illustration, you will see how the DOE, Department of Energy, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and USDA, programs can be braided together to support the various needs of the Jones family and to help them age in place effectively. I'll now turn it over to Amanda Raines. Next slide, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Raines. I serve as the Senior Policy Analyst for the Weatherization Assistance Program at the Department of Energy. 
Next slide. The mission of the Weatherization Assistance Program is to reduce energy costs for low-income households by increasing the energy efficiency of their homes while ensuring their health and safety. Uh, through our national weatherization network that's in every county of the United States, as well as the territories in DC, we serve about 32,000 homes annually and support or over 8,000 direct and in indirect jobs. Since the inception of the Weatherization Assistance Program in the 70s, we have served over 7.2 million households. Next slide. So for the Weatherization Assistance Program, we do have an income requirement of being at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. We do have uh, some categorical eligibility programs that we work with, meaning um, if they qualify for the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or um, there are a handful of programs through HUD where the income qualification is 80% area median income or below, they are considered um, income eligible for weatherization assistance. We also set some priority client categories, um, and those are for um, households that have a high residential energy use, a household with a high energy burden, for elderly persons, persons with disabilities, and families with children. And what this means is that when uh, a household applies for weatherization assistance, um, priority is given to these households. Next slide. So weatherization isn't just for homeowners, we can serve um, rental properties as well. So we serve single family, manufactured homes, small multifamily, as well as large multifamily. Next slide. <clears throat> So after a home is determined income eligible, uh, the next step is a home energy audit. And this is a comprehensive analysis of the home, which also includes a client interview where they're looking for opportunities for energy savings, as well as identifying any health and safety concerns. Uh, they create a customized work order. And uh, when the when that is done, they start working with um, train crews to install the new measures. And these measures have to um, follow national standards for how they are installed. Um, after the weatherization work is done, all homes have to receive a quality control inspection to ensure that everything's been installed correctly and the home is left safe for the occupants. Next slide. So coming back to the case study that you just heard about, with Kim, we're using Mr. and Mrs. Jones as an example of how all of these federal programs can be braided together to maximize services. So in this scenario, uh, we will say that through the weatherization energy audit, there were several energy efficiency issues as well as safe, uh, safety issues that were identified. So through that weatherization energy audit, they found roof damage, insufficient attic insulation, as well as wall insulation, um, bathroom safety issues, uh, mold and moisture issues, narrow doorways, uh, smoke, there was um, no smoke detectors or carbon monoxide detectors. There were lead paint risks, damage front door. Um, the list goes on. So uh, we're gonna hear more about how these programs can be braided together to um, to work on all of these issues for Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Next slide. So uh, these are the typical weatherization measures that are done uh, through the WAP program. So around the building shell measures, this is where um, we install insulation um, in the attic, in the walls, in the floor. We perform air sealing uh, and then that's just a couple examples. Same for mechanical. We do clean, tune, repair, and replace heating and cooling systems, uh, repair leak, leaks in the duct, uh, insulate ducts and heating pipes. And then under health and safety, we perform combustion appliance safety, make sure all those combustion appliances are, are operating correctly. Um, we can repair and replace venting systems, install mechanical ventilation, and then sometimes um, electrical and water measures are installed, such as low flow 
flow shower heads, efficient lighting, and then all homes receive client education. And we provide education on potential household hazards such as carbon monoxide, mold and moisture, um, air pollutants, lead, radon. Uh, we demonstrate the key functions of any new mechanical equipment and discuss the benefit of using energy efficiency products. Next slide. Um, in the Weatherization Assistance Program, we also have a handful of innovation grants. So we have a community scale pilot program, uh, which pilots place-based approaches to delivering weatherization. We have the sustainable energy resources for consumers, and this is for renewable energy and new technologies. And then under the Enhancement and Innovation Grants, we have readiness, health and safety, workforce development, renewable energy, and place space. Um, these programs are not offered nationwide. Um, they are competitive programs that, um, that different entities can apply for. Next slide. The other uh, program that I wanted to touch on was our Weatherization Readiness Fund. And that uh, started in program year 22, where Congress um, provided the Weatherization Network additional funding to try to address uh, why homes were being deferred from weatherization. And sometimes this happens because there's too much work needed for the house to safely protect all the work that weatherization would be putting into the house. Um, and so the types of services that can be provided under this are roof repair and replacement, uh, repairs to walls, ceilings, floors, foundations. Um, we can do exterior drainage repair, plumbing, electrical, as well as cleanup um, or remediation beyond the typical scope of weatherization. Next slide. So in the scenario with Mr. and Mrs. Jones, these uh, measures that are listed in blue are the ones um, that we could address through weatherization. So um, we would be doing a roof repair with the Weatherization Readiness Fund. We could install solar uh, PV panels with our CERC funding. Um, we would put in additional attic insulation as well as wall insulation, give them a program, programmable thermostat. Um, we would do duct sealing, repair their furnace, and install smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Next slide. So um, on our website, uh, we do have a link to how you can um, find out who your providers are in your local community. So please go to this website address, uh, click the state that you reside in, and then that should take you to the Weatherization Assistance Program Administrator's website for the state. And through there, there'll be a link to the sub grantee that serves your local community. Next slide. Thank you. And I will turn it over to Sashin with HUD. All right. Thank you so much, Amanda. Next slide, please. So good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Sashin Scott. I am a government technical representative within the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes um, in at HUD, Housing Urban Development. Um, specifically, I am within the Program Services Division um, directed by Yolanda Brown. I am also, uh, in addition to being a GTR, the point of contact for the Healthy Homes Production Grant Program. Um, and I will be discussing that program a bit further with you all today and how this program can be beneficial to your communities. Um, and as my colleague Kim Nesbitt mentioned, how this funding can be coordinated with other resources discussed on the webinar to benefit Mr. and Mrs. Jones housing concerns specifically. So let's get started. Next slide, please. So just to give you a general overview of the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes, our overall mission um, is to improve housing conditions and communities for positive residential health impacts. Uh, the Office of Lead Hazard Control, as a result, provides funding to state, local governments, and some nonprofits to develop programs um, to reduce lead-based paint hazards and other health-related um, concerns within the home. In addition to the administration of grant funds um, and services, our office also enforces HUD lead-based paint regulations, provide outreach, technical assistance, conduct technical studies uh, for evaluation, all to help protect children and their families 
from health and safety risk. Um, there are four divisions within the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes to help move this important work for forward, um, such as the Programs Division, Programs and Regulatory Support, Grant Services, and the Policy and Standard Division. Uh, next slide, please. So now that you have an idea of what we do in the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes, I want to specifically talk about the Healthy Homes Production Grant Program. So the Healthy Homes Production Grant Program, or H, uh, HHP for short, um, is derived from this healthy homes concept that promotes safe and sanitary housing as a means for prevention of disease or injury. As a result, the program focuses on making homes essentially healthier and safety uh, and safe, I should say, for families while still maintaining affordability at no cost to the family or the resident. With this concept in mind, the Healthy Homes Production Grant aims to identify and address issues, health and safety issues specifically, in a comprehensive way, rather than focusing on a single hazard at a time or maybe one area of the house. Instead, it works to uh, coordinate in a comprehensive fashion as many, as many, address, as many issues excuse me, um, within the home as possible. This approach allows for more cost-effective measures to ensure vulnerable residents receive the assistance that they truly need. In addition to um, addressing the efforts within the home in a more a systemic way, systematic way, um, we aim to provide uh, programs to help leverage partner resources and programs, again, to identify efficient methods to address environmental health and safety concerns in a more impactful way. So the program essentially, in addition to addressing the, comp uh, the nature of the hazards within the home, encourages partner resources and programs to help identify those hazards within the home. Next slide, please. So since the revitalization of the Healthy Homes Production Grant Program in 2002, we've awarded over 107 grantees through three funding cycles, all receiving funding within the ranges of one to two million dollars. Uh, the period of performance is typically, so the time frame of when you execute uh, these activities in terms of addressing uh, unit assessments or interventions for the home, is typically 42 months. Um, that accounts for that grant implementation, so getting key staff on board board policies and procedures for running the grant program and collaborating with community partners to address those hazards. Um, some of those that will I'll mention a little bit late in a later slide. Um, so that period of performance accounts for that time frame to help uh, the grantees who receive the funding uh, address uh, the issues within their communities. Uh, next slide, please. So typically who can apply for our funding um, are nonprofits, specifically with 501c3 designations, so service-based nonprofits, city, town, local, or state government agencies, as well as tribal uh, federally recognized uh, governments. Next slide, please. So now that we've talked about in general terms, the HHP program, you know a little bit more about the Office of Lehas Control, as well as uh, the recipients that could potentially uh, receive grant funding for the HHP program. Let's talk about the heart of the program, which is the people. So the intention of the program is to serve any household family composition um, that at or at or below 80% of AM, AM, um, area median income, AMI, and they can be living in res, uh, rental housing uh, or owner-occupied housing. Uh, keeping in mind um, in terms of the family composition of uh, at or below 80% AMI in terms of income, the funding aims to address housing-related health concerns in most vulnerable populations. So as a result, the opportunity advises prioritizing units uh, with children under the age of 18 older adults, um, 62 and older, or uh, and or families with persons with disabilities, given that it has been shown that a lot of these health and safety issues um, do uh, impact a lot of vulnerable um, residents within their home. We just emphasize that the funding um, is best utilized for anyone that's eligible, but keeping in mind um, these program partic participants that may need these resources most. So, and additionally to um, identifying hazards within the housing stock of the uh, um, program participant prioritizations that I've mentioned, and then of course households that are at or below 80% um, AMI, 
Um, we do encourage that um, recipients of this funding can identify housing in urban or rural jurisdictions, housing that was constructed pre-1978 um, or post-1978. Uh, one thing to note about this funding, it is um, to address the current residential housing, folks that are actually living in the homes. It can't be used to develop or construct new housing uh, stock. We want to make sure that we're focusing on folks that are actually living in the homes to make sure that they are able to uh, age in place. Place, um, or that they're able to uh, stay in the home and make sure that there's no um, negative impacts to the health as a result of um, some issues that they may not have been able to do so without this funding, address with, uh, without this funding. Next slide, please. So once a healthy homes assessment is completed, um, here on the left-hand side are some of the hazards or concerns uh, that could be covered within this funding. So specifically some of the things that we can test or uh, address uh, if needed based off of, like I mentioned, the healthy homes assessment. Um, this list isn't exhaustive, but they are some common considerations based off of what we have known to be true for a lot of our grantees. And then just the intention of the program as we implemented it. Um, on the right hand side is also other allowable costs so important work to help to address uh, units or assess units and address any of those uh, remediations or issues that um, may come about from the assessment so building capacity to train uh, maybe community partners targeted outreach so making sure that you're able to bring uh, find pr program participants and get the word out about the great benefits of this program and supplies necessary to help move the work forward so if there's anything that's needed in terms of completing the assessments or anything that is a result of maybe some hazards that are identified, our, our um, program funding can certainly address uh, those uh, supply needs as well as other uh, technical resources to help um, move, as I said, this important work forward. So next slide. So we talked about healthy homes in general in terms of the eligible activities, program participants. Now I'm gonna narrow down and talk about how this program can help to benefit Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Jones' um, housing concerns. So um, one important thing uh, to note is uh, one, what we can do with this grant program, you guys can see my pen here, we can address uh, moisture and mold remediation. So if there are issues um, such as um, that have caused maybe moisture or mold concerns, we can address those with the grant funding. Maybe it's repairing leaks, um, dehumidifying damp surfaces, or removing wet or moldy building components. We can certainly do so once uh, a healthy homes assessment, of course, is completed. Um, additionally, over here, you'll see that my uh, pencil is pointing to the lead-based paint testing and remediation. So given the information that Kim Nesbitt shared with us, this house was built uh, pre-1978. Uh, Mr. and Ms. Uh, Jones's grandchildren spend a considerable amount of time and they are under the age of six. So we want to make sure that if there are any lead-based paint hazards or issues, we can test to uh, see what those issues may be and then, of course, uh, remediate if um, needed. Of course, with radon being a concern also, if uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones does not have an active mitigate mitigation system or they haven't had a valid radon test within the past five years, we can certainly test for radon and if needed, mitigate that also with HHP funding. Um, also, another thing uh, to note, uh, again, this is just some of the many, um, a few things that uh, HHP can address of many things that you know our funding can also uh, assist with um, pest management and remediation so if Mr. and Mrs. Jones happen to have maybe some pests like mice, cockroaches, ants, or spiders, um, just some of those pesky creatures uh, living in their home um, through an environmentally sensitive approach, we can address those issues. So maybe sealing cracks, gaps, uh, maybe sticky traps, uh, you know, gel baits, anything to kind of help keep those pests at bay. Um, we use, use, we typically use an integrated pest management concept where we don't want any of those harmful pesticides that could impact Mr. and Mrs. Jones's uh, breathing uh, capabilities or their grandchildren's health by having, again, some of those harmful pesticides. So again, it's an environmentally sensitive approach that we uh, heavily emphasize it, again, once a healthy homes assessment uh, is completed. So next slide. 
So if you're interested in learning more about the Healthy Homes Production Grant Program or any of the programs within the Office of Lead Hazard Control, or also just learning about the different divisions that I mentioned in the office earlier um, on, the, on the webinar, my portion of the webinar, here is our website. Um, next slide, please. And if you have just general questions about the Healthy Homes Production um, funding opportunity, here's my contact information. Again, my name is Sashi Scott. I am a government technical representative within the Office of Lead Has Control Healthy Homes. Thank you so much for your time. I'm now going to turn it over uh, to Brenda Reyes, who also works within the Office of Lead Has Control Healthy Homes to share some more uh, other funding opportunities uh, that you can leverage on this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sachin. I love your presentation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brenda Reyes, and I am the director for the Policy Standards Division. Uh, this division resides in the office. Of, I'm sorry. Uh, next slide, please. This uh, office resides within uh, HUD. The Policy Standard Division support research on improving cost-effective methods to identify and control lead-based paint and other housing-related health and safety hazards with a particular emphasis on a children's health. Next, please. Our program include the Lead Health, the Lead and Healthy Home Technical Studies Grant Program. This is the research arm for the division, the Radon Testing and Mitigation Grant Program, and the Healthy Homes and Weatherization Cooperation Demonstration. Today, we are focusing on the weatherization, the Healthy Home and Weatherization cooperation demonstration grant. Next, please. The Healthy Home Weatherization Cooperation Demonstration Grant Program is looking for strategies to effectively coordinate between HUD, Healthy Home Production, and the Department of Energy WAP programs to maximize program efficiency and benefits in low-income communities. We award $1 million per application. The what, what can this grant do for you? Please first is support the coordination between HHP and WAP programs to maximize program efficiency. Further weatherization goals by, by reducing WAP program deferrals. Demonstrate sustainable models of inter-program cooperation, including data sharing and reporting. Promote sustainable financing, financing of coordinated healthy homes and weatherization intervention and create the opportunity to improve health outcomes by supporting data collection and evaluation. The, the purpose of this funding is to bring to the table these two grants, the Department of Energy and from HUD, the Healthy Home Production, WAP and Healthy Home Production. By looking at the houses, you will realize how they interact and how they can support how you can leverage the funding that each of these grants have. This funding, the Healthy Home and Weatherization Cooperation is precisely to bring them to the table, to bring both, to increase the communication between the two programs, the two grant programs, and to help them to, based on this communication, leverage their fundings. Next, please. The Healthy Home Weatherization Cooperation Demonstration Grant Program demonstrates strategies for effective coordination between HOT, HHP, and DOE WAP to maximize program efficiencies and benefits in low-income communities. These grants assist state, counties, cities, tribal that are federal, you know, federal recognized governments or other units of local government and not-for-profit having 501c3 status with the IRS. It helped them in reducing WAP deferrals and demonstrated sustainable models of inter-program coordination. These grants support evaluation of intervention methods to improve safety of households and improve health outcomes and indoor air quality residents of the residents. If an entity holds both a WAP grant or a WAP subgrantee, and an HHP grant, whether it is implementing the two grants for the same office or division or different offices or division, that entity may only submit a single application. Um, the, the, the beauty of this, again, 
it is bringing to the table these other these two grantees that do something similar attend the same community the same in low income communities and instead of having one incomplete with this grant we can bring both the department of energy and hot into that house and offer everything that has been described already by Amanda and by Sachin whenever they were discussing the Department of Energy WAP and the Healthy Home Production from HUD. Now, thank you very, very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Now I'm turning it over to Tanika Blue. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Tanika Blue. I am actually the chair and the government technical representative for the Older Adult Home Modification Program that resides here within the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes within the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I um, welcome you guys all here today, and I and I thank you for your time. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit about the Older Adult Home Modification Program and just uh, just discuss a different focus, I guess, on aging in place and how this program can actually be braided into some of the other programs that you've heard about today. Um, so the purpose of the older adult program is to assist organizations in undertaking comprehensive programs to make safe and functional um, home modifications and repairs to meet the needs of older adults that, are, that reside within our communities. Uh, the goal is to actually implement home modifications that are low cost, low barrier, but provide a high yield or high impact of, um, of uh, support to older adults um, with the intent to reduce falls, increase their independence with their everyday uh, self-care performance um, with an emphasis within this program to actually address the individual, the, uh, the, the person, the environment, as well as their occupational roles within uh, their home and within their families. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so um, who's available? So um, I'm so sorry. Uh, so um, who's actually eligible to apply for these services or through the for this grant? So this grant funds uh, city, state, local government agencies, um, nonprofit uh, organizations with 5013C status with the IRS. Um, and these uh, these entities will apply for grant services or grant funding through this program, and they will in turn go out into the community and provide these services to eligible older adults. Next slide, please. Um, and as I stated earlier, the goal is to provide these uh, low income elderly adults within our communities with low cost, high impact modifications to promote effective and safe aging in place. Next slide, please. Okay, and so just a little bit of information about who's actually eligible to receive funds through this program. Um, so this, this program is, is available for older adults who are above the age, at or above the age of 62. Um, they have to uh, be, have low income. And so that means that they uh, have an income that is either at or below 80% of the local area median income. And um, another uh, eligibility criteria for this particular program is that you must either own or rent the property in which you reside primarily. So we really want to focus on where this, where the individuals are residing on a day-to-day -day basis and where their actual roles are, are being um, implemented on a daily basis. Next slide, please. Okay, and so, um, I want to just speak a little bit about the program service model here. Um, so th through this program, assessments are, are a requirement, of course. And so one of the unique things about this program is that occupational therapists are actually the, the or are actually healthcare pr practitioners who actually provide these services or provide an evaluation to the client as well as to the home environment. And so they'll go into the home environment and they're looking for some incongruency between one's ability to take care of themselves from day to day and engage in their activities of daily living, which would include their, you know, dress, ability to dress themselves, feed themselves, bathe, um, you know, perform housekeeping, prepare meals, um, you know, get themselves in and out of bed every day, things of that nature. And so we want to really focus on how, um, how well a person can take care of themselves. And we want to also assess the environment just to see 
how the environment might impact one's ability to care for themselves from day to day and to take care of those essential daily um, activities. Um, and so the occupational therapist goes in and performs this evaluation after the, after the beneficiary is deemed eligible for the program. Next slide, please. And then from there, they will just develop a work plan or a, work, a scope of work. And they'll collaborate with their team and with the contractor to, to just determine what they'll actually also collaborate with the client to just kind of determine, you know, what type of modifications are will actually best suit the um, older adult. And so this could be installation of different adaptive equipment, ass assistive devices. This could be installing things like grab bars, ramps for individuals who have in, who have issues entering and exiting their home, maybe implementing uh, various thresholds uh, or, you know, smoothing surfaces between uh, rooms within a home. Um, it could be making a lot of modif making simple modifications to a bathroom. So maybe installing comfort height commodes, um, you know, maybe installing drop down cabinetry in a kitchen for someone who has range of motion, range of motion concerns, but performs their daily you know, meal prep and things of that nature. Next slide, please. Okay, and so this funding is is not, we're not, with this funding, we're not allowed to pay for, you know, real property. So we don't purchase any real property. This isn't like a renovation or beautification-based program either. Um, so we don't provide housing upgrades or, um, you know, extensive rehabilitation or remodeling activity, but we really do want to focus on you know, one's ability to assess their um, assess their home, as well as, you know, mobilize to get around from one room to the next to get in and out of their home and to be able to care for themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. Okay. And so I'll just kind of speak a little bit about the funding that we actually have available. So today we've actually awarded about a, a total of 46 grants. Um, this program is actually one of the newest programs within the Office of Lead Hazard Control uh, in Healthy Homes. It was established back in 2021, um, and we've uh, we are currently uh, have two cohorts who are serving for uh, 36 month grants. Um, the 2021 grant yielded about 32 grantees, and you can see them all placed here within the United States map. Um, next slide, please. And in the second year of funding, we actually awarded 14 14 new grantees. Uh, but, you know, we were only awarded 15 million in 2022. So that's why there, there are fewer, um, fewer pins here, but still made a pretty significant impact because we were able to reach quite a few states that we were not able to reach in the first round. And so we're currently, um, I'm, I'm actually currently uh, reviewing applications and the review process is underway for a, a third competition. And so we're hoping to make awards within the next couple of months for, um, for a completely new set of grantees. Um, so very, um, very excited. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and oh, I forgot to mention that a third of this funding uh, is actually, we're required to um, serve substantially rural populations. And so the range of funding for this grant ranges anywhere from $500,000 to $1.25 million in funding. Um, and it's a 36 month grant. And as I stated, we're, we are um, required to allocate at least one third of that 30 million to substantially rural communities. Okay, and I just kind of wanted to move along here and just kind of discuss uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones House and, you know, in this scenario and how the OMAP program or the Older Adult Home Modification Program can actually serve, the, serve this family. Okay, and so here, here we've gone in and we've installed, sorry. Okay, so here we've, we've actually gone in and made some installations within the bathroom. We've installed some grab bars. We have made some changes to um, to the, the sink within the bathroom, as well as um, provided a tub cutout so that Mr. Jones, who's wheelchair bound, can actually transfer safely in and out of the bathtub there. And here, because Mrs. Jones is responsible primarily for meal preparation and housekeeping for the grandchildren that they uh, that they're actually um, caregivers for during the day, she has some range of motion issues and some concerns. So here, we've actually installed some some different shelving and some motion lighting. 
just so that it's safer and it's more independent. Um, it's, it's, it's safer and it allows for her to be more independent within her environment. Um, and here, because Mr. Uh, Mr. Jones is, is you know, uh, newly, um, his mobility has changed and he's now wheelchair bound. We've actually implemented, um, we've actually gone in and widened the doorways within the home because they do have an older home. So most of the doorways are narrow. So we've widened those doorways to inc increase his access so he can move about the home safely and freely. Okay. And here we've also installed a ramp for Mr. Jones as well, because of course, Mrs. Jones does most of the driving. She's responsible for making sure that he gets to and from appointments you know, in the case, in the uh, event of an emergency, so on and so forth, we need to make sure that they're both able to enter and exit the home as safely as possible and consistently. And here, we've also implemented a, um, we've actually also installed a, a new refrigerator with bottom, uh, with bottom freezer drawers. And this is really essential to them because it allows for for the grandchildren, it allows access for the grandchildren to get in and out of the refrigerator to get snacks as they need to. And it also helps because of Mrs. Jones's uh, range of motion uh, concerns. And so it provides storage for them that they can actually access the things that they need in order to perform meal preparation from day to day. Next slide, please. Okay. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me. Um, I'm Tanika Blue. Once again, I'm with the Office of Lead Hazard Controls control and healthy homes. I lead the older adult home modification program. Um, I, I have my phone number here as well. I will also drop a link for our funding opportunities page in the chat so that you have access to this grant and others that we house within the Office of Lead Hazard Control. And I thank you guys for your time um, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. And from here, I will pass it on to Ms. Andrea Hively. Thank you, Dr. Blue. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrea Hively, branch chief with the Single Family Housing Direct Programs out here at Rural Development. And I'm just super excited about all that we've heard today. It's it's always important for us to work together in order to provide the best outcome for the people that we serve. And Mr. and Mrs. Jones are getting quite the great, the great services here between HUD and DOE and what I'm about to share with you as well. And I'm loving seeing you all collaborating here in the chat as well, because it really does take a village to serve our, to serve our communities. We here at Rural Development are specifically focused on rural communities. So next slide, please. I just have a few slides left for you and then we will get to the questions. So I think we will have some time. Keep those great questions coming in the chat. I'm going to talk quickly about rural development's organizational structure because, of course, you need to know the players if you're going to win the game. And then I'll talk about the rural area designations and our income eligibility because, as with HUD and DOE, the income always plays into your eligibility for our programs. And, of course, for rural development, you must be in a rural eligible area. Talk a little bit about program funding levels so you know what, uh, what to expect um, when you're coming to us for funding, how much money we do have. I'm going to talk about our Section 502 direct home loan, which is primarily used for home purchases, but if you can't get into that very low income category for our Section 504 repair loan, we can absolutely do a Section 502 direct loan to, get, to meet your home repair needs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about packaging because that's a way for nonprofits to actually make some money bringing applicants and applications to us here at Rural Development, which you may already be doing or may end up doing if you start utilizing our programs for your communities. And then last, I'll talk about our two primary home repair loan programs. Next slide, please. So rural development has a national office where I um, work and, and um, operate from, and, and that is primarily based on Washington, D.C., but I'm actually in Washington State, so we have coast-to-coast -coast coverage for you at the national office. We um, uh, allocate funding, we write policy, um, and do those kinds of national-type uh, items. The state offices actually direct the area and local offices, and that's who applicants really go and apply to is those area offices. So I would really encourage you to um, check out our website and drill down to who your state offices that oversees the state staff and doing all of the hard work to make these loans and grants out there. And then learn your area office staff because those are the real ones getting the work done and pushing those dollars out the door. Next slide, please. Second important website to check out is our eligibility website because you need to know where the rural areas are. You know, we say it's generally populations of 10,000 or less, but there's grandfathered areas up to 35,000. And we redo our maps about every two to five years. And we just redid them recently. So if you used our programs in the past, I really encourage you to 
come to our website here, the eligibility website, um, and drill into your state and your region, and you'll see this yellow outline. These are the areas that are eligible, and here's where you are eligible. Second important thing about this website is income eligibility. Our programs, you do have to be below a specific eligible or income level to qualify. And these income levels we do get in um, consultation with HUD every single year, and so they'll be coming out again here in the spring. But lucky for us, we have a hold harmless clause, so our income levels never go down. So eligibility website for rural eligibility and for income eligibility. Next slide, please. So how much money do we have? Well, last year we had 1.25 billion to make direct housing loans. Um, if the uh, news is right today, we probably only have about 800,000 this year. It does ebb and flow, but we'll get all that money out into the communities just as fast as we can. Now, our repair grants have been pretty consistent. We've been getting 32 to 30 million, um, and so we'd love to put that into your communities as well. Now, last fiscal year, we did receive some disaster-specific funding. So if you had a calendar year 2022 presidentially declared disaster, we have some money for you, and I can't wait to tell you about it because we want to get these dollars out into your communities. Next, our 504 repair loan. We do get, tend to get about $28 million there. And then last but not least, our housing preservation grant. Now, this is a cool grant because organizations such as yourself, nonprofits, housing authorities, can apply for this grant directly. And then you, in turn, provide those dollars to repair to the community. And you can charge part of your admin cost to that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. And, and we have a little disaster money set aside in the housing preservation grant program, too. Next slide, please. And I have to thank my esteemed Caroline Evans, who's dropping some great um, links to the chat for you, because obviously you can't click on your screen and just check them out right now. So if you do want to check them out right now, they're right there in the chat for you. And so thank you, Ms. Caroline. So our direct home loan program. Now, I mentioned that this is typically used to purchase a home, but we can use it for repairs. This is a low income um, eligibility, um, and it is a 1%, as low as 1% subsidized home mortgage or home repair loan. We can loan up to 100% of the value of the home, go up to 38 years even in some terms, um, and you just have to be in that real eligible area. Property requirements, we would just ask for an inspection be done, and we want to repair any major safety or health hazards. So this can be used for repairs, but it is primarily used for home purchases. Next slide, please. Packaging. You can package for the program I just mentioned or the one I'm about to mention, the 504 program. But the great part about packaging for our organization is you can get a fee up to $2,000 if you're working with an intermediary organization. And then the intermediary organization who helps you, you know, quality control your files, um, submit them through the eForms receptacle system, they'll take part of the fee in, uh, in order for providing those services to you. If you happen to get an opt out, uh, you could earn up to $1,750. But again, it's a great way to earn cash on something you might already be doing and a great way for us to get um, package applications that are ready to go and, and doesn't take a lot of shoring up with the applicant and working back and forth to get the documents we need. And a great way to start packaging for rural development is to do the 504 direct home loan and grant program packaging. It's a smaller fee, um, but you don't have to, to um, go through the steps to become a certified packager, which I'll talk to you about next. To become a 504 loan and grant application packager, all you have to do is sign a memorandum of understanding with your state office and you're off and running, helping the people in your communities. Next slide, please. So in order to actually become a certified packager, and the reason being is, you know, packaging mortgage home loans can be a little bit more complicated than a, a grant repair loan. You do have to have at least one year of affordable housing um, experience and be employed by a qualified employer. So that would be like a nonprofit or a housing authority, those types of things, Indian tribes, um, those types of things. You do have to take a three-day classroom training, and we do have those virtually offered through our intermediaries. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go to one. You might be able to get into one of those virtual trainings. And then after you take that training, you have one year to pass the test, and then you'll become a certified packager, and you're able to start earning the big dollars on those 502 direct home loan packages or repair loan packages. Next slide, please. This is just a map to give you an idea of who the intermediary is serving your area. If you're interested in becoming a packager, I really encourage you to check out this website, find who your intermediary option, intermediary options or organizations are in your area, and so you can contact one of them and get started. Or always contact a rural development state office. We'd be happy to talk to you and get you started on that as well, because we can always do more to together. Next slide, please. 
All right, now let's talk about what Mr. and Mrs. Jones got from us in this whole in this uh, whole repair project where we've braided so many great funds from across federal agencies. And I mean, some would say, wouldn't it be nice if we just had a one-stop shop? Well, if we could do it all in one program, we wouldn't need all these other programs. And so it really is important to learn about all the resources that are available to your community because you want those dollars for your community. So first, the 504 loan program. Let me back up. For every program you see here on your slide, you must be very low income. So I talked about earlier the 502 program for repairs. That's because that can go all the way up to low income. For 504, you have to be very low. And I would love to have a pretty slide that says that's below 60% of median income. But as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, um, we have a hold harmless clause. And so our income levels never go down. So you really got to go to our website to check out our income um, levels because you really can't make those calculations yourself based on median income. So below the very low income, you, applicants could be qualified for a, to a $40,000 loan for 20 years at a fixed 1% interest rate. So earlier I talked about how we have subsidy. That's not for this program. This is a straight 1% interest rate for 20 years. That's less than $200 a month payment to make some major repairs to the home. You could do anything really with these loan funds, except for like move a manufactured home or landscaping. But if they wanted to try solar and they have another heat source, we can do solar. If they wanna replace their kitchen cabinets because they think the other ones are ugly, they can do it. It's their loan dollars. So they can really use this for anything. The one kind of downfall to this program is the Housing Act of 1949 does prescribe that if the loan is over $7,500, we have to file a lien against the property. And we know with some of our elderly population, they do not want any lien against the property. They've paid their properties off and by golly, they are not going to debt it up again, right? And so sometimes that can be a challenge to um, help applicants understand that a loan is not a terrible thing. Uh, I will say we see a lot of $7,499 loans on the books and I don't say a thing about it. So the loan dollars are there. We'd love to have you help us use them. We have not been successful in spending those loan dollars in the last 18 years that I've worked for rural development. And now that I'm in charge of them, I would love your help in doing it. Breaks my heart. I want all of these dollars in your communities, not going back to Congress. No, thank you. So let's move on to the grant money, the grant program that everybody wants to um, get at. You just have to be 62 or older, below that very low income, and you and the money must be used to remove a safety or health hazard from the home or make the home accessible for a person with a disability. Maximum lifetime grant assistance is ten thousand dollars. So bring bring the money, bring the clients in, please, folks. We want to get these funds into your communities. Now, I mentioned earlier last year we got some um, extra dollars focused on disaster repair. Um, and actually, I fibbed a little bit. This program can go up to the low income level and there's no age restriction. So Congress made this really special for those calendar year 2022 presidentially declared disasters. And we have 50 some million still sitting there. So if you've got folks trying to repair disaster related damage, we are your partner. Next slide, please. So last, but certainly not least, the Housing Preservation Grant Program. Now this program is announced annually through a notice of funding availability or notice of solicitation applications, or um, I think it has a, a the NOFA, the NOSA, and there's a there's there's all these N1s, but all you have to know is you get your subscription to the Federal Register. And so anytime something's posted, you're absolutely in the know of when those applications are due. We hope this will come out soon after Congress passes the budget. Last year, we had about 16 million. So they all are smaller awards, but you as a nonprofit can come and apply. So let's say you come in and apply for a $100,000 grant. Um, you're going to try to repair 20 homes, maybe you have a bunch of roofs that need to be done, um, and you're going to uh, actually charge 20% uh, admin cost to that grant too. So you'll have $80,000 to repair those 20 homes, um, and, and that's the basic gist of it. Um, there's some nuances as far as if you're doing replacement housing, there's like a $15,000 cap. You absolutely can do multifamily housing units with this as well. We have several organizations across the, across the nation that are repairing their multifamily housing units with this, but it gets me excited because it's money that you can use and no no age restriction like with our other grant program I talked about and you can go up to that low income level so you can really serve a ton more people next slide please so short and sweet to the point, but I can't wait to show you here in a moment what we at Real Development put on the Joneses' houses. All of these links were already put in the chat, but they're going to be here for you as a resource as well in the PowerPoint that will be posted later with the recording. Next slide. 
Here is my contact information as well as my counterpart, Ms. Shannon Chase's contact information. I oversee all the special programs and new initiatives, and um, Shannon oversees that 502 Direct Home Loan Program, all the packaging, all the flagship programs. So I wanted to make sure you had both of our information, even though Shannon wasn't with us today. Next slide, please. All right, Mr. and Mrs. Jones's house has just come together so well. They are going to be able to age in place and be safe and take care of the things they need. We went with the new kitchen cabinets for those loan dollars. I mean, they had all these other fancy things. The cabinets just looked out of place and they said, yeah, you know what? We'll take that $7,000 loan and we'll we'll put in some new kitchen cabinets so that all of the great things that um, um, we have all flow together. We replaced the windows. That was one thing they thought, you know, we could definitely maybe save some heat savings here. Or, or even just bringing the house up to um, the the. 2000 centuries can be important. And then we replace the doors. Maybe they were heavy. Maybe they were just dilapidated. Maybe it was a safety issue, but we could do all of those things with our funds. And we were happy to work with um, the Department of Energy and HUD to make this home more than decent, safe, and sanitary. Almost a dream home for Mr. and Mrs. Jones to live in um, for the rest of their days. And with that, I think I thank you for your attention um, and for the other presenters for having me today. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions that may have not have been answered, and I'll turn it back over to our facilitator. Amy or Emily, do you want to throw out questions for the speakers or? Yeah, I was just going to say, how are we going to do this? So there are a number of questions that have come in the Q&A tab and been posted in the chat. And I see Ashley Monroe, you've had your hand raised for quite a while. Um, and so <clears throat> I think I'd like to prioritize the people who would like to speak out loud. Um, Ashley Monroe, are you able to come on camera and ask your question? I lost your hand. Okay, and I see Randy Trumbo. Okay, Randy, go ahead and ask your question. You may need to unmute. Uh, Randy, you, yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, I'm hearing a lot about this. Um, I've had help before. But now, uh, that was in Iowa. I'm in Illinois right now in the Quad Cities. And uh, I always wonder about this weatherization thing and see if I can get any help. But everything is based on my income. And uh, just wondering, can is there something that somebody can help? Hey, Randy, um, as I presented, the Weatherization Assistance Program uh -oh. is through low-income households that are 200% of the federal poverty level or lower. Um, DOE has- Your volume is real low. Yeah, so um, I believe if you could go to that map, that link that I provided in the chat and find out who your service provider is for your area and apply through your local- um, provider that you can see if you qualify for the grant program. If your income is higher than um, what we have deemed as low income, um, there are a lot of federal uh, rebate programs that are coming online in the state soon, and I'd be happy to drop a link to those programs in the chat. Yeah, that would be great. The other thing, Randy, you'll receive an email from us at the end with all the slides and links. Um, but we can help you identify what community action agency serves your area, because that would be your starting place for any programs. There's probably a variety of programs that you could be eligible for. Thank so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for, for asking your question out loud. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. So I saw some other people with their hands raised, but I'm not seeing them now. So I think I'd like to go back to the uh, Q&A tab. Oh, Linda Lopez, would you like to speak? Yes, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. We can hear you. 
Okay, I, I have a buyer that I'm currently working with and that they have applied for the USDA direct loan. However, they were told that there is no funding available. For what you guys are referring to here, is funding currently available or is there a time period that needs to be uh, met before funding is offered? That's a great question. And unfortunately, we are so the government has been funded under and some of you may know this two, two, three continuing resolutions, meaning that Congress has not provided us our full appropriation bill. And so under each one of those continuing resolutions bills, um, we are able to get partial funding. Um, but unfortunately, we ran out um, from this first or second CR, like the beginning of December. And so then by the time the second or third CR, I'm confused which one we're on now, it's two or three. I think we have another one coming, but um, we were so backlogged in those that were waiting on money from those three weeks not having money that all the money they gave us in the second one was gone. So as soon as we get a full appropriation bill or another CR, we'll get another um, drop of, of money in the bucket or or the money that we'll receive for the rest of the year. But it is true that we are going to be limited in our 502 funds this year because last year Congress gave us about $1.25 billion and this year I'm seeing about $800 million. So we're, we're going to be down... Um, in our funding. But what, what I would say is applicants um, are welcome to apply. We'll get them through eligibility and put them in the queue for funding. But that can be really frustrating for the purchase and sale process, right? We're asking for a 60-day purchase and sale agreement in hopes that we can make sure the funding goes through fine. But if you have a, a buyer that, or seller that's not willing, um, then that does create a challenge. So I, I hope Congress will be able to come together and get us a budget soon. Um, and we'll be able to uh, come up overcome this challenge a bit, but thank you for asking that question. Yes, we have plenty of grant money, um, repair money we do have, but unfortunately purchase money is a little low. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Linda. Uh, we have a question from Jomo McLean. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I work for a building development company and I see a lot of things that could benefit from, you know, getting some special accommodation. Like for example, you have um some uh, disabled parents who have to walk upstairs or some having problems, you know, they're ageable and they want to remain in their homes and they have the need for wheelchair uh, for, you know, some modification whatsoever. Now, can they apply on their own or, you know, we have to do that for them to get the help that is? I'll go first. For rural development programs, they can apply directly to us in their local office. Okay. But for HUD or DOE, I, I believe it's a little bit different, right? And yeah, for DOE, um, it's still the same process as I mentioned when talking to Randy. You need to find out who your local provider is and um, apply, but we do serve multifamily building. Okay. Good. Okay, so there are some other questions that are in the chat. Maybe I can read those out loud. We had a question about how long is the application for healthy homes? I think we had that in one of our other webinars as well. How long does it take to do that application? So I'll um, answer this one. In terms of the healthy homes uh, production grant opportunity application, uh, again, that local governments, nonprofit organizations, or federally recognized uh, tribal entities do apply. It's not uh, too long. Um, once the notice of funding opportunity um, is available, it will be posted on our website. Uh, we do, once uh, the funding opportunity is announced, encourage uh, folks to apply as soon as possible before the deadline, just to give yourself some time to get your application together. Now, in relation to recipients of the grant program, it would uh, depend on um, the eligibility requirement that the recipients of the grant funds. So again, we administer the um, funding to local governments, uh, state governments, nonprofits, and those uh, tribal federally recognized uh, entities. And then they create the criteria for the community based on what we have in the notice of funding opportunity. Um, and again, that application process may vary given that the um, recipients of the grant funds will include uh, the information in NOFO and then other local requirements. And so for the person who asked that question, I just want to double check. Um, were you asking about applying for yourself as an individual or for an organization applying to be a healthy homes provider? I'm not sure if you're still on the call with us. Just want to double check. 
Another, if you, if you, if you can come back and let us know. Um, another question that's been sitting there for a little while is a good one. Um, could a condominium association apply for a grant if the condominium was built before 1978? I think that goes back to a specific program. So I would say for healthy homes production, uh, it would depend, I think, um, depending on some of the nature, if it's owner occupied uh, condos and each uh, condo within that association would have to uh, apply based off of the criteria identified in the NOFO. Um, generally, we make sure that for owner occupied housing, it's each um, owner within the home, um, not necessarily association as a whole, uh, but again, it just would depend on specific details that we would need a little bit more information about. Um, but considering that it's built before 1978 and then they meet the income uh, criteria possibly, but again, we would have to explore that if that were, uh, the, uh, we would need a little bit more information um, to just fully give you know, the full answer to that. So I'd say in short, it would just depend um, given some more information about the, the circumstance. Okay, and then um, Ali al Asadi, you had a couple of different questions. And one was about funding opportunities for nonprofits geared towards education. And I was wondering if you could clarify, I just um, gave you permission to come on and speak if you'd like. Are you talking about for work to be done in structures owned by a nonprofit or an educational institution? Or are you talking about like funding to do education and outreach around these programs or something else? Ali is not coming back to us, but if you if you do want to speak to that, raise your raise your hand, Ali. Um, Jomo McLean. You had a question, Jomo. You have your hand raised. Yes, I was saying that if you could respond in a general way to that question, because some of us might want to, you know, like get the answer for that. You know, even though we can't. Sure. About you mean about the nonprofits and education? Yeah. Yeah. If any of our panelists want to jump in. I would just say for Healthy Homes Production Grant Program, um, the focus is, of course, the unit assessments and unit completion. Um, in terms of the education aspect of it, we can provide um, funds for you know direct other direct services, like I mentioned on this slide, to provide outreach and marketing that educates the community about the services, but ultimately for our program, uh, the Healthy Homes Production, it's based off of going out and providing the direct services. So it's not like an educational, like research-based aspect of it. It's strictly about providing uh, those assessments and those unit completions to the community. Um, and of course, as a part of that process of getting the word out about addressing those uh, healthy homes hazards, there is an education per, uh, component, but again, that's focused on unit production specifically. I hope that answers the question, I think from what I understood correctly. Um, and this is Amanda from DOE. I dropped a link into the chat for Renew America's Nonprofit uh, website, which is a program that helps nonprofits become energy efficient. Yeah, for the Department of Energy, there are, I think, a couple different programs that can do build various um, building energy efficiency retrofits for nonprofits and schools and things like that. All right, any other questions that we've overlooked? I'm so excited that we have so much engagement. Um, how about- sorry, here's I do a... want to add to the education piece. If, sure. um, for the HHP, if a organization um, that receives the funding and they need education about administering those direct services, we do provide the education piece for that. So if that was one aspect of um, the question that I missed, we do, um, for instance, provide like healthy homes, uh, best practices training. So helping to complete the healthy homes assessment for folks that are going out uh, the key staff to um, provide the services. So just wanted to add that there if that was part of it. Okay. Thank you, Sashin. Um, there's a question. Are all the funding opportunities restricted to recipients that have income limits? I think the answer is yes. So all, all the programs that we're talking about have income qualifications. Um, does anyone want to add to that? 
No, I agree. But since that's an anonymous attendee um, making mm -hmm. the question, I see one a little lower that might be them saying it a little more specifically. And it's uh, about health or weatherization or repairs for people who are actually renters mm -hmm. wanting to stay in their home since it's income based, whose income will be based on. And so I will say I for, for my two programs, the 504 program where the applicant is applying directly to us rural development, it, they have to be the owner for that program. But if, if the nonprofit has that housing preservation grant, um, they, they would be able to potentially repair that unit. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, questioning whether or not you're saying they like it's a, an individual home or like maybe even like a town home that an individual owns it's not like a multi-family mm -hmm. housing unit and that can get a little more tricky at least for my programs but they did they might be asking for weatherization or um the HUD programs as well so i'll stop there right this person is asking about weatherization or repairs and i and um I think it's just the, the simple question about renters versus owners. So in yeah. most cases, they're looking at the income of the renters, not the income of the owners. And so with weatherization and most of the other programs, the work can be done on a rental property. Is that correct? That is correct, Amanda. Yeah. What we do is the, the tenant, that is their income. We don't we don't go and check, you know, for the, the owner. Mm -hmm. But the tenant, of course, if you, you know, it's an owner occupied, then we qualify the owner occupied, you know, occupied and we check their income. Mm -hmm. But whenever it's a tenant, is the tenant income the one that we actually revise? And so like if it's a market rate property, um, you may have a landlord that isn't poor at all. But if the tenants are uh, below a certain income threshold, they should be able to get weatherized. There are some things that can happen uh at the state level that may influence, you know, that may change the way that gets implemented. But I think, Amanda, you were going to jump in. Yeah, I was just going to yeah say the simple answer is that it's based on whoever is occupying the unit. So it's, mm -hmm. it would be the renter in the yeah. question that was asked. Yes, um, that's correct. That, that would be the same for the older adults home modification program as well. So yeah. You, you would need to be the uh, either the renter or the homeowner to receive services. And for all of our panelists, are there barriers to getting the services done in rental properties that you're aware of? Because I think writ large, that's a thing that comes up sometimes. It's a, there are barriers that can happen. Amanda. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say um, that, you know, there could be barriers regarding like, do renters know or homeowners know mm -hmm. that the repair could be based on who's living in their house? It's not about their income, but who lives in the home. And then I think it's about, you know, needing to educate both the owner of the property as well as the renter on what's going to happen. What are the phases of weatherization? Um, so that everybody stays on the same page. Uh, okay. This is Brenda. And in our case, of course, you know, the environmental review where the property located. Um, and this is following, you know, because we bring the, the two grants together, they have to comply with the requirements from weatherization WAP and from HHP uh, um, grants from HOD. And one of the things is determine where it's located, if it's in the floating zone, if it's, uh, you know, there are certain requirements on that. And uh, on the same token, you know, whatever Amanda starts saying, it's uh, what it promote the deferrals and why our grants are so important. Because for example, if the house has too much mold, you know, that is one of the reasons for weatherization to do a deferral. Deferral is, you know, the, they cannot do the work. But in that case, you know, if you contact HHP or the Healthy Home Weatherization Cooperation, you know, the, 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 the communication, then you can leverage funds and these other two grants can actually inter-remediate, you know, uh, uh, and then weatherization can come and do their work. That is one of the purposes that, you know, for the, the Healthy Home and Weatherization Cooperation, uh, focus is definitely reduce the deferral by utilizing these funds, by making these two grants communicate and eliminate or reduce what are the items within the house that will prevent weatherization to do their work. Thank you, Brenda. Um, and then there's a more technical question 
from Marissa. How do the various programs that do interior home modifications balance the cost of lead testing and remediation in older homes with the costs of the rehabs they originally went in to make? So I'm not sure which, which programs she's talking about, but coordinating the order of operations for all the different forms of remediation is a hot topic. Sure. So for uh, the older adult home modification program and most of the other Office of Lead Hazard Control grants, um, you know, while we do allow for the braiding of, of funding for larger projects, of course, there is an environmental review uh, process that has to ensue. And so funding can be braided. And if we have uh, clients who have like lead based paint issues or, mm -hmm. you know, some other unhealthy or toxic uh, living environments, typically those 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 uh costs are offset so they don't actually figure into say for the older adult home modification program the five thousand dollar per unit cost mm -hmm. so as long as we can justify it and there's testing that's been performed to confirm that these are are true hazards and in some case some of the programs that applies to children who are under the age of six if they reside within a home and for some of the older adults as as well so it just kind of depends. But yes, it's typically not figured into the cost of the actual work that's being done initially. Okay, thank you, Tanika. And then, so Ali came back with a clarifying question. So he said, is Mike's not working, but is there any funding opportunities for nonprofits geared towards education, specifically for real estate professionals? And I think that ties to another question in the chat. Tanisha Brown commented, unfortunately, some of the owners haven't made changes to their property, which is unfair to the underserved communities. So I think where you're both going is, is there money to, and back to the question about renters versus owner, like all of this stuff together, is there money to do or ways to do working with these landlords that aren't keeping their buildings up where the tenants really need the help? I th am I, I, think, I think that's where we're all going. It's a good discussion topic for our last few moments. You know, for weatherization, we leave it to the local providers um, who are mostly community action agencies in your mm -hmm. community to do the outreach for weatherization. Um, and so I'm not, I know Chase uh, dropped a link into someone uh, or an organization that might do that for uh, large multifamily complexes. I'm not sure. Maybe Chase can clarify one more time. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just more through the community action um, agency to spread the word. Okay. But it's, it's a, it's a, it's an ongoing conversation. So working with difficult landlords is a, is sort of something that comes up a lot. Um, there's a, there's a smaller question from Barry. What if it was subleased from the owner to the renter and then the sub and then rent the sublease to someone else. So subletting um, that's kind of a programmatic implementation question. It might be, part of like a local procedural manual, but if anyone wants to speak to that. Does anyone have thoughts on subleases? I mean, yeah, I would agree. I think that is, it would depend. Um, I know specifically for the rental housing, it has to have a lease involved in terms of services. So again, it would be a little bit more question and evaluation to see what the case is specific to determine. I know for HHP, if that's something uh, that could potentially uh, be eligible, especially it gets a little bit complex, so mm -hmm. to speak, um, since you're talking about subletting from someone else. So essentially it's changing hands a few different times. So we would kind of need a little bit more information and it would be more uh, technical in the weeds if you had the funding to really uh, share if we could, if that's something that could be eligible. So it is a local uh, concern. And again, it would just depend on the policies and procedures once the grant funds are administered to the recipient and then you know administered out to the rental housing. So it would depend. Okay, and then there was a question about, um, oh, it just disappeared. If the application is based on the income for the owner or the renter, um, and Amanda answered it on behalf of weatherization, it's usually the, the, the renter that applies. And I think in some cases they need some permission from the owner. And I would assume that that is kind of the same way that it would work for the HUD programs. Yes, I think Brenda answered that too, essentially. Okay. The yeah, the application, if it's a rental, would be on the tenant. And then um, if there's other conditions, that's something we would discuss. But yeah, uh, Brenda answered that for the um, HUD programs. 
And uh, for Tamika, when is the next opening date and application deadline? Uh, we have not been appropriate. Funding has not been appropriated yet for the next round of funding, but I encourage okay. you all to uh, bookmark and monitor the HUD funding opportunities page. I did post it in the chat here, but I can post it again if need be. Mm -hmm. But I would tell you to, to continue to monitor that. That's where we would typically put any funding opportunities that arise. Mm -hmm. That become available. Okay. Um, did I miss anything in the chat? Is there anybody else that needs to raise their hand? I think um, Tanisha Brown commented on problems partnering with nonprofits and developers in Los Angeles. Um, any other questions or discussion items before we let our presenters go? Okay, I'm not seeing any other raised hands. So we're at, we are at the the end of the allotted time. So uh, we can go ahead and close the webinar if nobody else has any other questions. And as I said, I, there were a number of people asking about the slides and the recording. What's going to happen is you will get an email from me. So everybody who attended today or registered will get an email from me. We'll have a PDF of the slides, a link to the recording, which we post on our website. And then also I'll sift through the chat and make sure that everybody has all the other links that came up in all the question and answer. So any last closing remarks? Well, just thank you all for your time. This was great um, meeting with you all and learning about other programs outside of HUT. So thank you mm -hmm. again for having me. Yeah, thanks to all our federal partners for coming together on this. And we at NCAP look forward to continuing to present joint content from our, our federal partners like this. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.